Speedrunning breeds competition. Friendly feuds are forged throughout all of speedrunning history over trying to beat a certain time. We've seen this play out time and time again. Collaboration often takes a backseat to competition, which makes the story of Ty the Tasmanian Tiger all the more remarkable. Of the many popular platforming games that came out in the late 90s and early 2000s, Ty is not one of them. However, the small community of Thai runners saw the game not for what it was, but what it could be. They all worked together to make it the run it is today. They did it for the love of the game. They held out hope that their faith would be rewarded with a great speedrun. Were they right? Welcome to Speed Docs. Tie the Tasmanian Tiger is a 3D platformer game released in 2002 for the modern consoles at the time, the Nintendo GameCube, the PlayStation 2, and the Xbox. The game follows the title character Ty as he explores the Australian-inspired landscapes in search of thunder eggs to rescue his family and save the world. In order to do that, he'll need to collect different kinds of boomerang weapons, help out the locals, and navigate the landscape. In order to complete the game, players need to collect 17 Thunder Eggs in each of the three hub areas of the game. After getting 17, a portal to the hub area's boss fight opens, where players are rewarded with the new Elemental Boomerang weapon if they win. The rewards for these fights are the Flame Rings, which burn objects, the Frosty Rings, which freeze enemies and make platforms on water, and the Zappy Rings, which stun enemies and start up old equipment. After beating the third hub boss, players can head to the end gauntlet at Cast Pass to make their way to the final boss. With all that out of the way, let's get started. Ty the Tasmanian Tiger was not quite the commercial hit back in the day. In an era that launched the careers of many gaming franchises and iconic mascots, Ty was met with pretty poor reviews. That feeling was shared by not only the commercial and critical crowd, but early speedrunners as well. Where a lot of games had some kind of early start, Ty wasn't even allowed into the club. But by 2013, the speedrunning scene was entering into a new age. With the ascension of speedruns live and Twitch, most of the popular speedrunning games had dozens of runners, established knowledge bases and resources, even their own websites. Ty, on the other hand, was just getting its first chance. MHF Silver and Wolf Luke were looking for a new game to dive into. The two had dabbled in other speed games, but the popular games were pretty much solved. These two explorers were on the hunt for uncharted territory, a game with speed tech to explore, routes to be charted, and glitches to be discovered. After looking through his dusty game shelf, Silver landed on time. So at the time, uh, I was only really speedrunning Star Fox games. And I had a small group of friends that we had talked while I was streaming and everything like that. And we wanted to try and find a game that would be interesting to speed run that nobody had done before. And a friend of mine in the group who at the time went by Wolf Luke, Th Wolf Luke 13 had suggested a couple games. And we both actually had played Ty the Tasmanian Tiger way back when it first came out. And we both settled on that game because we both had experience playing it. We both really liked it it as we well when it came out and so we decided to then like immediately sit down and try messing around and see what we could find as speed running became more popular the groundwork for developing speed runs was laid out practicing glitch hunting routing all of these things became commonplace and widespread for games of all kinds 
Silver and Wolf Luke had all the tools they needed to start working on their childhood favorite game, right? Uh, it was very stereotypical of like no, having no idea what's going on. Neither of us did any real glitch hunting before. We were both relatively new to speedrunning back in like 2012 when we started doing this. So we had little to no experience of anything. What we did is the, the old fashioned look at SDA and Google tie the Tasmanian tiger glitches. Well, I'm sure they'll do fine. While Ty had some notable flaws, there was a solid structure underneath. While critics were relatively unimpressed, players were fond of the diverse level styles and locations, the charming characters, and the tight controls. At the time, Ty was competing with Spyro the Dragon, Crash Bandicoot, and Mario. It's no wonder it went relatively unnoticed. But in a vacuum, Ty is a pretty fun game. Silver and Wolf Luke were determined to show off what the game really had to offer, which is easier said than done. As a platformer, Ty has some moves and abilities to help him navigate the world. However, unlike most platformers, Ty doesn't have any moves to make him go faster. No rolling, no diving, no sprinting. Ty's fastest movement was just walking normally. The character does have a glide ability and can swim, but the majority of the run was just that running from point A to point B. Without any real tricks or techniques to build with, Silver got to work just getting runs on the board. Silver plots out a basic route to get things started. Instead of trying to find the fastest eggs, he seems to just get the first 17 he can think of in each hub. His first attempt lands him a 2.15.08 time, but in a few days, he's got it down to a 1.46.36. Pretty soon, Silver's work got the attention of more runners. With a dedicated chat room in the Speedruns Live IRC, Ty was finally getting some visibility. Literally. It had been 11 years since the game's release, and the channel served as a reminder that it still existed. Runner Henjo steps in and gets a 135.52. But things really got started when J-Camp showed up. J-Camp took an interest into the game like no one had before. Running the game often and racing when he could, J-Camp started to tighten up the screws. He rerouted the Thunder Eggs in each level to find a faster route. With his new route, J-Camp practiced and improved quickly. Over the course of a few months, he had brought the time down to a 1.14.16. This was the uncharted territory that Silver and Wolf Luke had set out for. In the five months that this Thai community had been around, they had started rounding out all of the Thunder Eggs in the run. Since they only needed 51 eggs, or 17 in each section, runners had the freedom to pick and choose the fastest ones. Much like in Jack and Daxter, or Super Mario 64, finding the fastest path to the fewest number of the collectibles was a slow but rewarding endeavor. Now in September of 2013, the run was in a good place. MHF Silver had been watching the whole time, and wanted to keep improving the run. He knew that he wasn't a world-class speedrunner or glitch hunter, so what else could he do? He decided to reach out for some assistance. Silver was acquainted with famous glitch hunter Ababoth, known for his glitch hunting efforts in The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Without a lot of experience with the game, Ababob had trouble finding any major glitches or tricks. This was also around the time that the Wind Waker route was going through an overhaul because of the discovery of Super Swims. More focused on that game, he couldn't devote a lot of time to Ty. One of the things that Ababob did do was test a theory that runners had been toying around with. You see, much like with the Wind Waker with its barrier skip, Ty runners also had a crazy idea to skip the last part of this game. For those unfamiliar, in the Wind Waker, a thin barrier prevents players from accessing the end of the game until players have beaten certain bosses and obtained certain items. In the same way, this giant gate in Rainbow Cliffs blocks access to the final boss until the third world is cleared. Using an emulator and cheats, Ababa was able to confirm that the loading zone for the final area was in fact always active. He showed us that yes, it's there, it's always loaded, and it's always accessible. So at that point, it became our equivalent to like the moon warp or barrier skip, where it was like, we have, we know for a fact 
that all we have to do is get behind this one wall and a whole third of the game is completely irrelevant. But it was a matter of how do we get behind that gate. It wasn't much, but this little morsel spurred on the community. With this, Abba Bob went back to the Wind Waker. Runners like Silver were excited by the gate skip idea and did what they could to try and sneak past the gate. Unfortunately, the developers at Chrome Studios had worked very hard to prevent that from happening. For now, this gate skip remained a pipe dream. In the meantime, J Camp was happy to get his sub 115 and had moved on. In his place, runner to Squirrel came in behind him. Squirrel added in a few new tricks to help him save time. On the first level two up, he pulls off a precise glide to skip to the top of this waterfall, a shortcut that saves him 30 seconds. Towards the end of the run, on Cast Pass, he pulls off another jump to skip some platforms and saves another 30 seconds. With a 1.14.12, Squirrel sneaks in a four second best time. World record! Oh my god! 1.14.12. Nice. While the route was coming together, Silver was still stumped with Ty. After five months of running and routing, the community had only found small time saves. Not to mention, they still don't have any leads on getting that gate skip. Convinced that there weren't any glitches in this whole game, Silver dipped into the well again. Silver reached out to Glitch Hunter Chronikees, known for her work on Banjo-Kazooie. With a comment claiming there were no glitches in Ty, Chronikees was intrigued. Starting in January of 2014, Chronikees went to work. In no time, she started dropping videos on how to get out of bounds in several maps, how to activate switches through walls, and even how to skip the majority of the level Liar Liar Pants on Fire. Chronikees had single-handedly broken through Ty's walls, and found minutes worth of time saves. Chronikees dropped all of this on the small Ty community. Ty finally had some tricks and glitches to call their own. But uh, yeah, Chronikees found skips that are still used to this day. Um, so I, I feel like probably eventually those kinds of things would have been found. But having someone who's um, having someone who's well versed in that come to a little known game and find a bunch of this stuff was very helpful at the time. It really definitely transformed the run from being super basic, where there would be like a couple of minor things to where, hey, we have actual skips that skip things. Yeah, but unfortunately she never found that gate skip, so. While Chronikees was getting to work with glitches, one of her friends decided to pick up the game for himself. Less than two weeks after she started finding tricks, runner Dark Popo was already implementing her findings into the round. Quickly, Popo rose to the top and beat out to Squirrel's record by a full four minutes, a 1.10.35 on January 21st, 2014. Popo took to the game very quickly, and he stuck with it. Consistently coming back to the game, Popo brings the record down to a 101.54 in just a few months. Popo saved almost nine minutes with the help of new tricks, such as slide one skip on Walk in the Park, and a tough new skip known as Mill Skip, a trick that saved almost two minutes. Papa was also saving time by playing on the fastest version of the game, the Xbox release. With faster load times, the Xbox version saved two minutes over the GameCube and PlayStation versions. After a break, Papa comes back in 2015 to finish what he started. On February 27th, 10 months after his last PB, Papo starts up another run. By now, the first hub is very optimized, as it's been played a thousand times. Popo gets all the tricks with ease, like the waterfall glide on 2-up, the slide 1 skip on walk in the park, and hitting the sunken ship switch from the other side. But hub 2 is where he can save the most time. When he left the first boss fight, he was only 9 seconds ahead of his PB. After quickly hitting the turkeys on bridge and getting mill skip first try, he leaves the second hub 29 seconds ahead. On Liar Liar, Popo uses the out of bounds trick that Chronikees found to skip to the end of the level and do it all in reverse. He even uses these frill enemies on Black Stump to give him a boost up onto the pillar. The run is going smoothly. He's now almost 40 seconds ahead of his best time. However, 
a death on the fluffy fight at the end of Hub 3 loses him about 8 seconds. Still, Popo cruises through the final area to take on the boss. He destroys the turrets and the wires before he throws the Doomerang through the final tunnel. After flying through the pipe for 2 minutes, Popo becomes the first person to get a sub hour time, a 5904. This run was huge. Popo was several minutes ahead of the next fastest runners, and no one seemed up to the task of taking him down. It also didn't help that most runners were going to need to get an original Xbox in the game in order to compete at the highest level. Popo would cross the threshold from fun casual speedrun into serious business. As such, Popo's times would stay uncontested for a while. Popo had pushed himself to really take Ty as far as he could, but he ended up going too hard. After grinding for this long, Popo tapped out. He even got Ty accepted into SGDQ 2015, but between the submission and the actual event, Popo had sworn off Ty for good. Pulling himself out of the running, he left a void with no one there to fill it. People were excited to see Ty, but were disappointed with Popo pulling out of the event. Still, this left an opportunity for someone else to rise up and fill that role. A newer runner to Ty was excited to run the game. Meet Kaithal. Kaithal was a big fan of Ty and had dabbled in speedrunning in 2014, but after catching some Ty speedruns, he decided to give it a try himself. Starting off, Kaithal couldn't afford an Xbox setup, so he settled for his childhood copy on PS2. As a fresh runner, this didn't seem to bother him too much. Kaithal had played Ty often as a kid, and quickly excelled at the speedrun. However good Kaithal had gotten though, he was still no match for Popo. At least, not yet. It would take almost a year before he could compete for the record. He had practiced and played for a long time now. His skills were sharpened. All he needed now was the hardware. After graduating from high school, he took his graduation gift money and got an Xbox and a copy of Ty the Tasmanian Tiger. Now he was ready to play. This is the part of the video where we tell you all about the exciting run that Kaithal got. The part where we'd break down what Kaithal was doing to improve his time in order to take down Dark Popo. But we can't. Several years ago, Twitch had a server issue that permanently lost a large swath of highlights and VODs across the site. Some channels were unaffected, but Kaithal's channel was lost in the fray. Inexplicably, around 2017, all of Kaithal's content was lost. It was recorded at the time, witnessed and approved, but cannot be seen today. The important part? On May 21st, 2016, Kaithal became the second person to get a sub-hour time. In fact, he passed over Popo and landed a 58-55. After a year of practicing, Kaithal was taking the game seriously. Just before Kaithal's 5855, Chrome Studios announced that it was porting the original trilogy of Thai games to the PC. While they technically released a beta version back in March, the game had major stability issues and was not in a good place for speedruns. However, by the end of the year, a remastered Thai the Tasmanian Tiger was polished and ready to go. After testing it out, the Thai community noticed that the PC version was definitely faster and at a reasonable price, the PC version instantly became the preferred way to play. Runners came out of the woodwork to jump back into speedrunning the game. One of those runners was KFN Nappa. Nappa had originally started out running on the GameCube version of the game back in 2015, but was never really a contender for first place. But with the new PC version, Nappa had a real shot. In fact, only two weeks after the PC's full release, Nappa became the third person to get a sub hour time, a 5735, world record by over a minute. Where was Kaithal in all of this? When the PC version first released, the difference in time was immediately apparent. The community was under the impression that it might be within one minute or so faster than its console counterpart. Kaithal wasn't interested in making that switch just yet, because the difference wasn't too bad. Looking at the other runners, no one else was within 3 minutes of his time anyways. In fact, 
Kai thought was gearing up to run the Xbox version of Tai in the speedrunning event Valuethon. Before the marathon, however, the PC runners were really digging into the run. As they got more comfortable with the new controls, they started to really get ahead of console players. Notably, on console, Tai has to stop moving in order to precisely aim his boomerangs. On PC, players could use the mouse to aim while still moving. It wasn't long before Nappa had another major record with a 56-44. Not wanting to switch versions right before the event, Kaithal sticks it out with his old Xbox copy. As he's practicing and preparing, he gets a new PB, the first since his world record back in May. This was a bit of a surprise, but he couldn't have seen what happened next. At Valuethon, the run is going great. A few slip-ups here and there, like second try liar liar skip, but everything else is running smoothly. He even gets good RNG on Rex Marks the Spot. After almost an hour, Kaithal sends the last Doomerang home. The final time? 58.20, a console world record during the marathon. Chaos has been <laughs> um, that's world record. The Tasmanian tiger. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna be blatantly honest, that's world record right now. It's not my PB, my PB is a 58.07, but that's officially world record. Kaithal's run was the best console run anyone could have hoped for. It was executed cleanly, had only a few small mistakes. Unfortunately, this Xbox run just couldn't cut it against PC. As a last vestige of an older age, this run stands tall even today, as runners focused almost exclusively on the PC version now. Seeing the writing on the wall, Kaithal knew it was time. Though he was a console holdout, a month later, Kaithal would make the jump as well. Initially, runs on the PC version were the same exact route, just performed on the faster version. But as runners started to get used to PC, they started finding new improvements. For instance, on the Outback level, there's a segment where Ty rides the boar boss from Hub 1. On PC, there was an oversight where if players moved with the WASD keys and moved with the controller analog stick in a different direction, the game would add the speeds together. This made it so they could move at speeds normally not possible in this section. Aside from that, with the new control scheme, players found new setups and faster ways to do sections of the run. Following a brief adjustment period, Kaithal was back in the saddle. With a new kid in town, Kaithal drew newfound inspiration from the competition. In March, he had a great run that just missed the mark, a run only about 10 seconds behind Napa. After another month, he takes the shot. 54-25, a world record by a devastating 2 minutes and 19 seconds. The sheriff had restored order to the town of Tasmania. He had written out to meet his enemy and delivered a decisive blow right between the eyes. Kaithal was now the second person to get a sub-hour, the one who surpassed Dark Papo, he who sleweth Napa. There was just one issue. Nobody told Napa. Just two days later, Napa snagged a 54-23 for himself. This was a body blow that knocked the wind right out of Kaithal. The feeling of defeat had overtaken him, and Kaithal decided it was time to take a break. To have months of hard work washed away in just two days, who wouldn't be deterred? As we often say in our videos, complacency is the enemy of perfection. Now running unopposed, Napa stepped away as well. These two couldn't stay away forever though. After a few short months, both Kaithal and Napa came back to de-rest. In August, they each find themselves with new PBs. Kaithal with a 5401, and then Napa with a 5313. It was the same old song and dance. No matter how far Kaithal pushes himself, Napa was ready to go one step further. This time, however, Kaithal was not going to quit. If you're gonna be the man, you gotta beat the man. He wasn't going to be able to rattle off a massive PB like Napa seemingly could at any time he wanted. It was going to be slow going. Kaithal was the crock pot to Napa's microwave. Eventually, Kaithal caught up, closing the gap with the 5335. Just a few days later, he had taken their record back with the time of 5312. After a grueling slog, 
Kaithal takes the record, but only by one second. For Kaithal, it was time to hang it up. After running the game for about four years, he couldn't go any further. He still loved the game, but World 3 was giving him too much trouble. With its RNG and stressful areas, Kaithal was losing sleep over losing runs at the last leg. There was a solution though, find Gateskep. Players still needed the special boomerangs from World 1 and 2, so they would still have to play those, but the zappy rings from World 3 only served to open the gate. If runners could just find gate skip, they could skip the third region, the hardest and most frustrating part of the run. This was Kaithal's ultimatum. I will return when gate skip is found. Kaithal's spirit had resolved to take him farther than he himself could have ever anticipated. These victories were always short-lived. Perennial adversary Nappa would always come back and improve the record, sometimes without breaking a sweat. Not long after Kaithal's exit, Nappa took the record back with the 5305 on February 25th. Nappa's no slouch, and he proved to everyone that he could get the record at any time he wanted. But without a challenger, how long would Nappa's interest persist? Fortunately for Nappa, new runner Bruh was making great strides and was now on the precipice of challenging Nappa. Bruh was capable of being a contender. It was exactly what Nappa needed to keep going. On July 12th, Bruh got a 5301. Unfortunately for us, Bruh's footage has been lost to time. However, if you've been following our story thus far, you already know what's about to happen. Two days later, Nappa clapped back with a 52.35, a 26 second world record. Like Kaithal before him, Brug grinded to narrow the gap. A little over a month later, he was able to sneak in a 52.30. For those who are unaware, Nappa's mantra in life is, the first 48 hours are the most important. Because two days later, just like last time, he blew Brug's doors off with a 51.47. That's some Napa know-how. By this time, however, no one else was able to catch up. Napa waited for another challenger, but nobody came. Runners had found so many optimizations over the years, the times were getting pretty hard to beat. Without any new innovations or challengers, the run was starting to stagnate. Napa would eventually move on to other games. Bruh, his only major competition, was inactive as well. Ty would go quiet for a little while. In mid-2019, Bra would eventually come back, but with the 5203, he was still a little ways off from Nappa's time. It would take a new runner to close the gap. Starting at the end of 2018, runner Lowell's XD had been crawling his way to the front of the pack. When Bra got his 5203, Lowell's was just getting a 5316. But as summer came around, Lowell's was ready to put his axe to the grindstone. Week 1, a 52-15. Week 2, a 51-53. Week 3, 51-19. World record. But Lowell's wasn't done yet. By the end of the month, he had gotten a 50-55 and a 50-42. While he still had momentum, he kept going into August. With his biggest jump of all, Lowell's saved another 30 seconds with a 50-12 a day after his last PB. At this rate, sub-50 is right around the corner. Lowell's keeps pushing. Not even a week later, Lowell's gets on a good run. Hub 1 goes swimmingly, and he's sitting two seconds ahead. The second area does not go so smoothly. Lowell's gets a nice gold split on bridge, but after getting caught in a tornado on Outback Safari, he ends up in the red. No worries though, Lowell's climbs back up before heading into Hub 3. His bad luck didn't end with Outback though. On Liar Liar, he drops the stun lock on the Sly Fight. This is normally really easy, but Lowell's loses focus for a moment and loses about 10 seconds for it. The run isn't over though. There's one last saving grace. On Beyond the Black Stump, Lowell's lost 32 seconds on his last PB to Booney a runaway koala that drops a thunder egg when caught. Because he can run in several directions, Lowell's lost a bunch of time chasing him. This time around, he wasn't going to miss. 
After a clean stump, Lowell's grabs Booney and quits the level, now 14 seconds ahead. He even keeps that time coming out of Fluffy's Fjord. On the home stretch, this was his ticket in. He can head into the final gauntlet with just enough time. At least, it was enough time until he filled a clip on Cass Pass. It wasn't much, but this four second mistake was the nail in the coffin. The rest of the run goes uneventfully, and he closes it out with a 50.06. This should have been it, but Lowell's tapped out seven seconds before the mile marker. After this crazy grind, Lowell's put Ty down and walked away. It was an impressive display to go out on, but once again, the game would have to wait for someone else to break through this barrier. The rest of 2019 was quiet, even the beginning of 2020. While we're waiting for the next training montage, the developers of the game finished the port for the Nintendo Switch. Both the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One ports would come later, but now the game was on PC as well as a modern console. With it, the game got a new patch for a few quality of life updates. While PC was still the fastest version, the newer console releases brought in new players to the scene. In fact, one very important player joined the community through the Switch release. His name was Brandorn the Great. Brandorn wasn't one for running, but wanted to contribute something. After talking in the community discord, Brandorn met runner Dr. Landshark. Together, the two started discussing glitches and tricks, and spent time glitch hunting and sharing notes. Pretty soon, Brandorn was jumping at walls, climbing unclimbable terrain, and swimming into corners looking for new and useful tricks. On May 30th, he found something. Brandorn had accidentally stumbled across something strange. Ty has a diving ability which allows him to enter the water seamlessly. However, when doing this against a wall with water underneath, Ty slowly slides down instead. This part was not new, however, it wasn't useful, as players can't turn or move during the dive, and they slam into the ground like normal at the bottom. But because Brandorn was doing this on the level shipwrecks in these shallow pools, Brandorn slowly drifted down into the water, and then was swimming in air. This was new. Remember that quality of life patch introduced with the newer consoles? One of the fixes was to help with one particular objective and bridge over the River Tye. In that level, there's a tutorial on diving that requires players to dive into the water and break the box. However, the hit detection on this box is pretty bad, giving most casual players a rough time, even throwing speedrunners from a loop pretty often. In an effort to remedy this, Chrome decided to make some changes. However, Instead of altering the box's collision to make it easier to break, they decided to alter Ty's collision and change exactly when Ty is considered in water. When the patch was first released, it actually introduced new crashes into the game. Because the runners didn't understand why the game was breaking, most runners reverted to an older patch. Because of this, it would take a dedicated glitch hunter on the current patch to find this trick. Brandorn was in the right place at the right time. Because Brandorn dove into the angled wall, he slowly approached the water. Once he touched the water, his downward momentum stopped, and he never fully entered the water. Now, he could safely swim above the water, but that's not all. He could continue swimming on land, even up angled walls. This was monumental. This was ground swimming. With his simple screenshot and Discord message, the community erupted. Swimming on land? Swimming up angled walls? This could open up tricks and routes on almost every stage. Not to mention, Ty's swimming speed is faster than his normal running speed, meaning that this was the fastest mode of movement around stages. The possibilities were endless. But none of that mattered right now, because there was only one thing on anyone's mind. Gate skip. Runners instantly started looking for ways to get ground swimming near the final gate in Rainbow Cliffs. This trick was still brand new, and it would take a bit of time for everyone to figure it out. After searching, they found a spot. To the right of the generator, there was a wall next to the water that would suffice. However, because of the shape of the walls around this area, ground swimming wasn't the fast and easy solution that they thought it'd be. There was, however, one glimmer of hope. To the left of the gate was a large palm tree, 
one that angled itself up to the top of the gate. It had been a long night for the community, so they went to sleep to try again tomorrow. The following day, runner Coral Killer got an early start. After testing and playing around with the tree, he was really close to getting up to the gate. What he realized, though, was when Ty falls off the tree, he changes from swimming to treading water for a short moment. In the treading state, players can't move anymore. Instead, they'd have to quickly jump and maneuver where they wanted to go. After figuring out the timing and the angle, Coral was able to climb the tree, make the jump, and grab onto the ledge at the top of the gate's collision. This was it. Gate skip was a reality. Coral wasted no time. Starting up a new run, Coral was going to be the first person to cash in on this. He lost a few minutes by messing it up a few times, but that didn't matter. Coral did the first ever run with gate skip, a new world record of 4131. The community rejoiced. Someone get Kaithal on the horn, this was not a drill. In a flash, Kaithal was back online. The same day it was found, Kaithal was doing runs. Even though this was a new trick for everyone, including himself, Kaithal cleanly pulled it off first try, saving four minutes over Coral in the process. Closing out the run, Kaithal makes his triumphant return with a 36-39. This was a literal dream come true for the community, especially Kaithal. I go to bed, um, wake up the next day just super excited, and then I find out that it's been found, and I do I do my first couple of runs with it, and it was just relieving to not have to play that third hub of the game. And I remember going to bed that night just after all that, and I remember I just kind of cried uh, for a solid half hour in my bed um, because again that that was something that I had thought about for tw almost twenty years. I just cried. It, it was super emotional and it sounds it sounds dumb for some people but that's just how it was it was a mystery that had had been there for so long and i finally had an answer uh and it, it was just so relieving this was our barrier skip that we have been waiting for for like literally years it was for the longest time i've said like finding you know ground swimming and leading into gate skip and you know everything around it has been like one of my just huge accomplishments and since then, and even before then, but it was really that moment that kind of solidified to me. It was like that moment of like the feeling of belonging, like we did it, like this is us, like this is this is us, that community. And it just felt really special. Like it's a moment that I really, it's, it was really amazing. This was the shot in the arm the community needed. Ty was running out of time to save, but with ground swimming, the floodgates were open. In just two weeks after ground swimming was found, 15 minutes had melted away from the world record. Kaithal was true to his word. With gate skip, he was back to running the game in full force. After the 36-39, he got a 35-38 a few days later. A few days later, runner George1254 took the title with the 35-12, but was quickly beaten seven hours later by Kaithal's 34-50. For the next month, Kaithal grinded away, going from 3440 to 3351. Ending his spree in July, Kaithal could retire happy. With the discovery of gate skip, the community was expanding quickly. Kaithal might have had his fill, but the rest of the community was just getting started. Brandorn was also working on finding new strats and breathing new life into the run. For a game that felt stagnant just a year ago, Ty was now more busy than it had ever been. For a lot of runners, ground swimming was the breakthrough they needed to start or come back to doing Ty speedruns. At 50 minutes in length and with heavy RNG in the third hub, the old route was not very enticing. But now, players got to run a much more palatable 30 minute run with all of the best parts left in and the worst parts taken out. One such returning runner was one Kama Crimson. Kama had done 100% runs back on the PC version in 2016 and 2018, but had moved away from tie runs since. But with the activity around the new any% route, Kama's interest was renewed. 
Funny enough, he actually doesn't start running the category with Gate Skip or Ground Swim. He runs Old Any% percent, which is now called 51 Thunder Eggs, No Ground Swimming. Before he moves to the new route, Kama is on a personal mission. First thing on his list? Finish the sub-50 run that Lowell's never accomplished. Starting in June with a 101.19, he had a very long way to go, but he's determined. Running up the hill is never easy, but everyone's got to do it to get to the top. By the end of the month, he had a 52.52. Can he go the distance? The next month, a 51.05. He's gaining on him. In the waning days of summer, Kama overtook Lowell's, a 50.04. Kama's crusade was not for first place though, he needed that sub-50. Before September ends, he had done it, a 49.58. On the flip side, Dr. Landshark had been practicing and pushed the any% percent record down to 33.21, beating Kaithal by 30 seconds. Kama thought, if he could take the old 51 TE record, he could probably take on any% percent too. So the funny thing about any% percent is that at the time at least, a lot of the run was similar to 51 TE. There was very little rerouting at the time, just a couple ground swimming tricks, and then you skip hub three, the hardest hub in the game. So I actually had a pretty easy time getting world record. I th I'm definitely positive it took me less than a month. It was very fast. Kama had trained to run a mile when he only needed to do a 40 yard dash. With 4-3 speed, Kama decimated the leaderboards. After a month, Kama got the any% percent world record. By year's end, Kama had the world record sweep in all three major categories, any% percent, 51 TE, and 100%. This explosion from a runner who was the new kid on the block not six months prior. Yeah, honestly, still one of the best feelings ever. The sweep was something I didn't actually plan on getting, ever, I'll be honest. Um, not until after 51 TE. So the fact that I got it and kind of didn't believe it for a couple of days was almost relieving and surreal at the same time. A little bit of both. Around the start of 2021, the community starts Tie Tuesdays, a weekly race and get together. Lots of big names are making an appearance, like Kama Crimson, Coral Killer, and Bruh, but newcomers like Sir Lawrence NZ are also joining in. Lawrence, aka Lon, starts improving in these weekly races. Every single week, I was just driven to, after every race, I would just sit down and I would practice for hours and hours and hours and just try and master everything that I could so that the next week I'd be able to smash my PB by a few minutes every single week. Ten days after his first speed run, he's in seventh place. Nine days later, he's in fifth. Pretty soon, he's top two. Taking down Kama was not going to be easy. Lon needed all the help he could get. Lon reached out to Brandorn for ideas. Brandorn had spent hours just poking around in every level, finding and documenting every little trick and glitch he came across. Most of the time, these tricks were benign, but some of these tricks had major potential. Together, these two fiddled around with some of Brandorn's more interesting findings to try to make them viable for runs. The one they landed on was 2-up skip. 2-up is the first level in the game, and contrary to the name, 2-up skip does not skip the level entirely. About halfway through the level, at the fourth Bilby crate, there's a pool of water and a bridge across it. As it turns out, the pool of water is connected to another pool by the last Bilby crate by an underwater path. With a precise setup, Ty can dive into the water and get just enough depth to swim under the arch and make it to the other side. Together, Brandorn, Lon, and another runner, Tinsel Mikado, worked on finding out how to make this trick consistent. This skipped some of the path and saved 13 seconds. Kama had an impressive lead, nobody could deny that. Catching him was going to be challenging, but with Brandorn's help, Lon was going to catch up. With the help of 2-up skip and hours and hours of grinding, Lon took the record for the first time in July. 31.07, a 5 second improvement. Never dispute the value of a great pit crew, they keep you in the race. Lon would go on to improve the time twice more, 
with a 3057 and a 3052 over the next few weeks. Birdie! 52! That's another world record! And don't bloody doubt me! Don't! This was the hardest that Lon had ever grinded. He pushed himself to the limit to get these times. This run wasn't going to be easy for Kama to take back, but it wasn't going to be impossible either. In a run that could have just as easily gone the other way, Kama barely takes the record back with a 30-50 on August 30th. 30-50? That's world record, dude. That's world record, baby. Let's go. Yes. Very fucking solid. Let's go, man. Oh my God. Almost a 30-40. Yeah, boy. Give me that shit. Let's go, dude. Let's fucking go. 30-50. Let's fucking go! Yes! Lon had fanned the flames of competition and given Kama a run for his money. While they were at it, Brandorn and Lon looked at one more trick for the round. On shipwrecks, runners were walking up the Long Spire Mountain to grab the Thunder Egg at the top. But back in 2020, Brandorn had found a way to get a ground swim on that little island. By using the seahorses that are lost around the level, it was possible to bring them close to shore and then dive at them to just barely touch the water. Problem was, the waves changed the water's hitbox and made the whole trick wildly inconsistent. But Brandorn and Lon were going to try to make it work. Lon's first setup essentially dives onto the seahorses to start the swim and looks at the tides to make sure he can get on land. While it wasn't perfect, it did cement the idea that a setup could be possible. Kama would end up taking inspiration here to find a more consistent method where he walks slowly to get the right angle and then dives between the seahorse and the beach. This was significantly more consistent and would be refined to the setup everyone uses today. Now that he can hit this trick on a regular basis, Kama starts adding it into his route. After grinding out runs, he uses Spire Swim to get a 30-27. Yes! Yes! Oh my god! Holy! Oh. I just skipped 40 and 30. There's your dab. I just skipped 40 and 30. I actually just skipped 40 and 30. Kaithal had had a dream to see Gate Skip but Brandorn had a dream of his own. Ever since he joined the community, Brandorn could see that the game had so much potential. Even if he didn't know how, he knew that a sub-30 was possible. Before Gate Skip was found, that time was very far away, but Brandorn never stopped believing. By always hunting for new tricks and now working with Lon, he was slowly making that dream a reality. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Lon is working with runner Buzz G to make a Thai practice mod. A practice mod is just what it sounds like, a modded version of the game that makes it easier to practice certain portions of the game. With the ability to advance to a later section and create warp points to take you around the level, runners could hone the craft twice as fast in half the time. This also opened the door for the pair to test a theory that Brandorn had. On the final boss fight, runners had to throw the Doomerang weapon to navigate through a twisting and turning twist of turbulent tubes. This perilous pipe network was a proper pain in the ass. One final hurdle for runners to trip over on the home stretch. Brandorn had an idea that these pipes might be loaded somewhere in the level at the start. Instead of gently guiding the gliding Doomerang glibly through the wide gauge pipework, what if runners could skip directly to the end? After plenty of testing, Brandorn was able to get the Doomerang out of bounds and explored the area. He was right. High above the platform for the fight, the pipes and tubes were there, waiting for their time to shine. That's the good news. But there was an issue. These pipes weren't held together with chewing gum and best intentions. In defiance of everything else we've come to know about this game, these pipes were assembled by a master welder, sealed up and built to last. Not even the roughest, toughest tiger in all of Tasmania was going to get these tubes to bunch. Even though the tubes had plenty of joints and were built in segments, they were airtight. 
No matter what he did, Brandorn could not get the Doomerang to squeeze through. The only way to test it required over a minute to set up a single try, so brute force testing was also slow going. Brandorn was committing headwall with the boomerang in a tube. Testing was too tedious for any real progress to be made. When I originally found Doom Clip, for like ages and ages, you know, like I was just years really. I was like, I know it's possible. I kept trying it, I could never get it, but I pretty much undoubtedly was like, this is possible, I know it. Lon didn't give up hope either. You see, with this practice mod he was working on, Lon could teleport himself on top of the level, meaning he could get right up on the action and test to his heart's desire. While Brandorn had to spend a minute every try, Lon could just spam away. Working together with Buzzchi, Lon went about carefully inspecting each segment. The two actually found a few entry points, but they were near the beginning and wouldn't save time. However, these pinholes gave them hope. Further down the line, Lon accidentally stumbles across a potential entry point. At the final seam, there was just enough space to scrape through the joint and into the pipe. This was huge. After a bit of practice, Lon confirmed it was real. This doom skip would be the largest time saver since gate skip, saving 60 seconds over the normal way. The doom rang, got in, and we're just screaming with joy, like, yes, it's real, we've done it. Brandorn's dream, our dream, is real. Sub 30 was real. Now you might be thinking, Lon probably started up a run right then to capitalize on this new trick, right? Well, in the spirit of competition, Lon instead calls a meeting for all the top players. Lon lays all the cards on the table. These are the steps to performing Doomskip. The players all agreed. This trick saved enough time that anyone who got it would likely take the world record. They might even take sub 30. Let's knock this out of the park together. With the specifics ironed out, Kama, Coral, Tinsel, and Lon set themselves up for a race. The prize at the end was the glory of a massive new time save. The runner who won this race would be rewarded with being the first to achieve what was once believed to be impossible. Who was going to do it? Kama had the meteoric rise from the outhouse to the penthouse back in 2020, which was remarkable in and of itself. Would it be him? Coral was the first to get gate skip only a year ago, and he was a capable runner in his own right. Could it be Coral? And how about Lon? Lon had been right smack dab in the center of everything since he joined in 2021. Or maybe Tinsel, a helping hand with glitch hunting and a talented runner. Who was going to do it? Who was going to be the one to grab that brass ring? How can you not be romantic about speedrunning? For most of these runners, the runs do not start on the right foot. On 2-up, Tinsel misses the 2-up skip twice and opts to just walk around. On shipwrecks, both Coral and Lawn have trouble starting their spire swims and lose at least 30 seconds. The one having the least amount of problems is none other than Kama Crimson. As the other three start to unravel over the course of the race, Kama is holding on for dear life. After leaving the Cranky fight, he's 22 seconds behind. It's not great, but with his 3027 PB plus 22 seconds, he's still within 60 seconds of the 30 minute time. All he has to do is keep it together and close it out. He loses another two seconds on cast pass. It's time for the final battle. After clearing the turrets and breaking the wires, it all comes down to this. He throws the doomerang into the corner and clips out of bounds. This skip was revealed for the first time only an hour ago, and Kama has barely had any practice. But with a cool hand, he sends the ring up to the sky, lines up the shot, and pulls the trigger. The shot flies true. Kama squeezes in at the final moments of the run. Sub 30. Yes! Let's go! Ah! Yes, dude. First yes, try! Yes! yes. yes. Sub 30! Let's go, dude. Oh my god! Yes! Yes! Congratulations, world's first sub 30. Oh my god, we beat sub 30. Oh my god. 
This is a gone. monumental day for the history of our The story isn't over, truly. Since ground swimming was discovered in 2020, the game has gone through a renaissance. With brilliant minds and dedicated runners working non-stop to improve the run, the game is changing all the time. Even in the time since the sub-30, Hub-1 has been rerouted to delay getting the second boomerang, and Kama has gone on to take the sub-29. As a community, these runners have stuck with this game through thick and thin. Not because this game was popular and the cool thing to do, but because they loved it for what it was, and wanted to see it flourish. To look at the history of this game, from the SDA days when no one would give it the time of day, to the burgeoning community who played it on their childhood copies, to the PC revolution and the new renaissance, Ty has grown into a truly beautiful and awesome speedrun, and it's all because of the loyal community. As for our runners, Kaithal is still looking for a gate skip on the original console. It's not much, but it'd be closure for that lifelong dream of his. Lon and Brandorn are always looking for new ways to save time as well. There's even new runners like Pizza Boy 08 who are climbing the leaderboards in search of glory. With the new practice mod and dedicated strat finders and glitch hunters, the full history is still being written. But they have the tools to forge their own futures, to tell their own stories now. So for anyone out there listening, remember, even if things look like they're over, if it seems hopeless, if there's nothing left to do, keep believing. Sometimes, dreams do come true. Thanks for watching our video. If you want to join the community, check out our Discord. Also, consider supporting us on Patreon. It really helps. Thanks.